Okay, we're going to go to item B, which is the South 288 Street Road, 85% uh, design status report uh, and bid authorization. And the microphone is yours. Oh, I see uh, Lydia is joining us also. Lydia, can you hear me? We'll have council member Lydia will be on. The mic is yours. Okay. My name is uh, Omar Barone. I'm a senior civil engineer for the City of Federal Way, and I'm here to present the 85% uh, design report update for Phase 1 and Phase 2 of the South 288th Street Road Diet Project, and also seeking authorization to bid Phase 1. This project is one that we're taking on primarily as a safety project. Uh, in a five-year study period that we did, we had 289 collisions through this corridor. About 111 of those were rear end collisions and it's pretty, pretty plain to see why that is. We have two lanes each direction and really anytime anyone tries to make a left turn, that inside lane has to stop. We also had a, a nice incidence of uh, uh, T-bone collisions. So as folks are pulling off of the side roads as well, they're really looking for that gap. So we had a, a, a fairly high number of those uh, T-bone collisions. So it's really the left turn. And it's something that King County also saw the need to do because they started their phase of this uh, just to the east of us in front of Thomas Jefferson High School. So we're really just completing the work that they started to the east of us. So this is the proposed configuration that we have in mind to uh, implement out there as far as uh, providing a safety, um, safety measures of this. Uh, we're going to reconfigure the existing uh, four lanes to provide this uh, two-way left turn, um, center turn lane, and then um, also dedicated bike lanes. So really, um, anytime anyone's going to try to make that left turn, they're going to be able to jump into the center turn lane. It's going to keep the traffic, traffic moving that way. We also are going to implement some pedestrian crossings with flashing beacons. And the existing volume of this roadway is low enough that it, it, it's conducive to us being able to do this without creating significant delays um, through the corridor. The level of service along this corridor actually stays the same or gets better. This is our project budget. As you can see, we're very heavily um, grant funded. So our, our grant funding partners, they, they're also ones that are in support of this project and they also believe in the safety aspects of this project. TIB particularly was interested in this project because it fills a gap, really that pedestrian non-motorized gap that exists now between the road diet to the east of us and the non-motorized trail to the west of us that's being con constructed along the west side of Pacific Highway. And then just a quick note about phasing, just due to the access of our um, grant funding, we're going to have to have phase construction um, of this project. So the first phase will be east of Military Road. So that'll be phase one. So um, pending authorization to bid tonight, we'd be looking at um, opening bids in February, returning to LUTC for contract award in April, and starting work in either May or June for phase one. And then we would be coming back in approximately one year to seek the authorization following that same schedule for phase two, which would be to the west of 25th place south. So the options before you, the option one would be to authorize staff to complete the design for phase one and phase two of the road diet project, authorize the bid of phase one, and authorize staff to return to LUTC and council for bid award for the reports and authorization. And option two is do not authorize staff to complete the design of phase one and phase two, nor bid of phase one, and provide direction to staff. The mayor recommends phase one. And I'm available for any questions that you might have about the project. Uh, Councilmember Walsh? Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, sure. First, just for my edification, uh, the TIB grant, what does TIB stand for? Transportation Improvement Board. Okay, all right. And secondly, with the phase one and phase two, I'm assuming that the phase one area is where the most accidents have been, is that correct? Um, the accidents have been pretty well spread out throughout the whole corridor. So really, we have to address the entire corridor. We're having these, you know, these, these issues, but we have seven different study intersections that we looked at throughout the corridor. I believe one of them was east of, of uh, uh, east of military, but it's really the entire corridor is where we've had these problems. Okay, so um, so one major intersection in the phase one area and so several major intersections in phase two. Yep. And so it seems like that the phase two area would be made phase one and done first then if, if that's where the most uh, accidents have been. Hi, 
Christine Mullen, Engineering Manager. Um, we also got a grant for, for bike and pedestrians, and that funding is available for this upcoming summer. And the funding for, that's provided from them is for the section east of military. Okay. So it's based on the grant funding is how we prioritize the funding, the all phasing, right. not based off of Grant safety. funding makes a lot of sense then. Yes. So, all right. Thank you. Okay. De Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. In, in your work, as you've been doing this, have you been talking to the people that live around, around there and that have businesses around there? We did. So we just hosted a uh, webinar this just this last uh, week, last Wednesday. It was pretty well attended. We sent out, I believe it was like 111 different invitations, and we had roughly about 30 folks show up and just ask a, a number of questions. They seem to be concerned about about taking away lanes, right? And that, that really is, it seems counterintuitive, but you know, really working through and talking through the traffic study and being able to explain to folks that really for the volume that this has, 4,000 average daily traffic in each direction, it's something that, that, that we are able, able to do without causing significant delays. So they were accepting of this? They, they left liking this or? Yeah, absolutely. So are the accidents that have occurred, are they because people are not paying attention, they're going too fast? Um, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, really, but uh, I mean, just looking at the numbers that we have, just because we have, you know, 63% of those are rear, rear end collisions, mm -hmm. you know, it really seems to, you know, especially with the number of uh, side roads that we have that tie into us, north and south, into heavily, predominantly residential neighborhoods, I mean, when that inside lane stops, you know, folks are either going to stop for that car in front of them. They might jump out and cut off the person that's beside them. Um, it's it's hard to say exactly, but um, we're doing we're doing the best we can as far as what we can do at, to reconfigure the intersection to just for, for to provide a better alternative, safer alternative for making those left turns. All right. Thank you. I just have, I have one question. Uh, we start with phase one and then phase two is going to come through the intersection at military, correct? Yep. And will that intersection in phase two in the following year, will that, you'll be tearing up that uh, area by Safeway and on all that and then moving forward? Is that kind of the plan? Well, so the area, the, the, the pavement gets overlaid and then the extent of our work at military in 288 is to replace the existing signal. Oh, okay. So we will be, you know, we're, we're going to be replacing the wheelchair ramps on the corners, mm -hmm. but as far as, you know, very uh, intrusive work out in the intersection, that's not really, really not going to be the case. Okay, great. Yeah. Any other questions? Do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 3rd, 2023 City Council consent agenda for approval. I second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. No more questions. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, we'll, now move. we'll now move to item C, which is a Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue compact roundabout request for additional funds. It's always fun, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> My least favorite. Yeah, well, we're a, we're a good group. We like yeah. to listen. <laughs> It was moved. Put it in the corner just so I can. And I'll shut the screen. Okay. Uh, good evening, um, Chair and members of the Council tonight. Um, I um, am here to um, ask for additional funds, like the title says. Um, we had uh, difficulty with this project. Um, we are near complete. Um, all that's left is striping out there. Um, this was just prior to the splitter islands, um, the yellow striping that you see um, going in. Um, some of the problems we faced with this project um, was um, uh, underground utilities that were failing. We had uh, about 68 feet of uh, storm pipe, corrugated metal storm pipe that had eroded and rotted the belly of it. Um, and it was just not right to leave it. Um, that needed to be redone. We had significant problems on the southeast corner, um, just to the left of the picture here, uh, with uh, that 
that ditch goes from anywhere from just a trickle of water to dry to kayaking um, type of volumes through there. So um, the, um, the design left uh, quantity bus in several different areas on this project um, that we were able to mitigate some of them um, and not others. And so, um, yeah, we are in need of extra funds. Uh, the project budget uh, breakdown is before you, um, in which um, we have, uh, it's primarily a grant funded project, um, but um, the uh, transportation capital fund, the 306 fund provided about a 185,000 or so. Um, and we are needing about another 100,000 out of that. Um, I think that um, through the review, we were left with about 1.5 million in excess um, in that fund to cover unforeseen expenses like this. Um, so we have two options, uh, whether to authorize it or not authorize it before you today. Uh, Mayor recommends option one. And I'm happy to answer any questions I can. Any questions uh, from anyone? I guess that's why we have the fun, right? Yeah, and uh, I, I much more enjoy uh, building hey. projects that I've designed. But well, think of it this way. Fun. Think of it this way: you get to be the first one in December to ask for more funds based on inflation or something. So you, you know, you get to pi you're the pioneer. So we thank you. <laughs> All right, <laughs> appreciate that. Uh, Welcome, Deputy to Mayor uh, Honda. You have a question. Thank you. So, yes, if um, if this is approved, is that money needed for something else that will have to come back and get money from somewhere else or is that money that's just waiting to go to a project uh, i believe ej can help with that yeah so there's a little bit of money in the starting fund balance to cover situations like this so it'll come out of that it won't impact other projects okay thank you i did wait to present to make sure that there was no other unforeseen issues in this this is it. Well, we know there's going to be some somewhere in the future. So <laughs> yeah. like I say, you're the pioneer. You get the arrows in your back first. Any other questions? Uh, do I have a motion? I, yeah. I move to forward uh, the proposed option one to the January 3 to 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, we'll move to item D, Pacific Highway South non-motorized corridor, 85% design report. I gotta see if I can find mine now. I gotta close his. Can't see very well. Um, should have worn my glasses because it wasn't where I was. I can't read this. Can you? Jeff, come here <laughs> It's kind of tough with one arm, isn't it? Yeah, well, and, it's, <laughs> and being blind. <laughs> that Pack Highway A trail, non motorized. There it is, yep. Sweet. Okay, so now I need that back up. Oh, I should do this one. There we go. Hold on. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so. Okay, so now I'm going. Uh, my name is John Mulkey. I'm a senior civil engineer for the City of Federal Way, and I'm presenting the Pacific Highway South Non Motor Race Corridor 85% Design Report. Um, and we are at this point just seeking to move forward with the, to the 100% design level. Um, this project is going to be um, in. Constructing a non-motorized trail from South 3 or 4th Street to South 288th Street. Um, part of that is alongside existing right-of-way and some of it's in unused right-of-way. Um, the project's going to be constructed in two phases. Uh, phase one is going to be from South 3 or 4th Street to um, Southwest Dash Point Road. And then phase two is going to be from South 308th to South 304th and then from South Dash Point Road to South 288th Street. 
Um, the reason it's getting split up is uh, for multiple reasons, but um, the two biggest ones were there are some issues with the acquisition of right away in the north end um, that require some long-term advertisements of those pieces of property before they are fully acquired. And then the second one being would be available of grant funding for construction. So we have multiple grant funding on this project. So we're gonna be uh, applying those phases when those fundings become available. And this is a map showing where that is. Um, this is the project budget. Again, we have multiple grant funding um, opportunities. We have four different federal grants for this project for construction and for design. Um, we are all fully funded for both phases of construction. So at this point, we're just ready to move forward to finalize design and complete right-of-way acquisition. And so the options considered are one, to authorize staff to proceed with the design of the Pacific Highway South non-motorized corridor project and return to the LEDC and Council at the 100% design completion for further reports and authorization, or two, did not authorize staff to proceed with the project and provide direction to staff. And the mayor recommends option one and I'm available for questions. Council Member Walsh. Yeah, can you go back to the map for, for a moment? For the... I'm gonna probably have to start over, but here we go. Got it, yes. Okay, so the top one. Uh, is the south end. Is the south end and the bottom one's the north end. Right, okay. so they're basically split. If you line okay. those up, it was too long to put in one slide, so we kind of cut it in half in okay. the middle of the, the length of the project. Okay, so it's really not along Pacific Highway South, really? The, the it, it follows the, the corridor. It's called this because it's an alternative route to Pacific Highway South. There's okay. a small portion of that follows next to it right in front of Federal Way High School, but that's the only portion of the trail that's actually adjacent to Pack Highway. After okay. that, we turn away from that, and we fall 16th Avenue South down to Redondo. And then once we get through Redondo and a little bit into there, we fall, there's an existing utility corridor that's open with the pursuer and PSC and things like that, that we're gonna be following that part up to 288th Street. So it'll be paved then? And yep, we'll put in, that'll be a paved path the whole way. And then it'll also have illumination, and, and you know, it'll have some landscaping, things like that. But okay. Well, once it hits 288, it just stops then, or, or is there Right, and we're going to be connecting already? up actually with um, what Omar presented. That is actually part of that trail as well. So that coming down 288 on that side of the road will be a, a wider trail connecting into that that will part of that non-motorized is to continue up 288 and extend that on that. So that is connecting into that. And then there's plans for the future to also extend, I guess, north along 16th at some point in the future. But right now we are connecting into that, that non-motorized corridor that's getting in with the 288th Road Diet Project with the improvements there. Okay. All right, thank you. So, so I have a question. I walk that all the time. There's a path that goes there. Are you gonna basically replace that path and take that big hole or the, where the water runs through and cover it up and make it just Okay, yeah, well, okay, so yeah, there's the a couple of different things. So right where that path starts, yeah. we have two different, we have another project that I'll probably be coming to talk to you about soon, which is a, the culvert replacement. We're yeah, replacing okay. that culvert. That's what I'm talking there. about, yeah. Yeah, so we have uh, the culvert replacement project there. So we replace that with a fish passable culvert. It's supposed to be next summer. And then um, we'll also begin starting on the phase one, which won't be where phase two is. So that's part of the phase two. Um, area, but we'll be running that path along in that same area with a, a paved path in that same area. But we're also going to have a new culvert underneath of there before we do it. So it'll make it a lot safer. Well, wasn't there something on the culvert replacement before us just a couple of months ago? Yeah, the 30% design on that was a couple okay. of months ago, okay. and I'm going to be bringing that to 85% here probably in, in this winter. Okay. And then we'll be going out for add of that in the spring too. Okay. Good. All right. Thank you. Okay, no, any other questions? Okay, do we have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward the proposed option one to the January 3rd, 2023 consent agenda for approval. I second the motion. And it's been moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Okay, you get to come up for three times. You're lucky. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk about E, citywide pedestrian safety improvements, 85% design, status report, and authorization to bid.
Good evening, um, Chair Dovey, committee members, council members. My name is Jeff Han. I'm the civil engineer for the City of Federal Way, and I'm presenting the citywide pedestrian safety improvements 85% design status report and authorization to bid to committee. Um, there are a total of eight locations for this project in the city of Federal Way. Um, the estimated expenditure is approximately $1.74 million, and the available funding is also uh, approximately $1.74 million. Uh, staff anticipates bidding this project in spring of 2023, and construction begins summer of 2023. There are two options before committee, and the mayor recommends option one be forward to the December 21st, 2022 CD Council Consent Agenda for approval. And staff is available for any questions you may have. Do I see any questions? Yes, uh, Council President Kochmar. Uh, hi, uh, could you put that map back up? It was hard to see, it's very hard to read. Very hard. Yes, I mean, can you uh, um, and talk about what those, we can't read the writing. Um, there are eight locations and let's see. we putting um, the RR Epis on eight different locations. Um, this is on 320th by 1400 blocks and this is close to uh, 45th. This is on 312 um, kind of uh, east of Pack Highway, and this is on uh, Southwest Das Point Road and 312. Uh, this is on uh, 336 and around 10th place south. Um, this one, sorry, this is by, uh, is on 9th by um, uh, San Francisco uh, Hospital. And these two are one on 356 by 23rd place, uh, 23rd Avenue Southwest. And uh, this one's around um, 18 Avenue Southwest. So um, with these different eight locations, are they basically, it's, it's hard to see what's going on. Is there like an improvement to a sidewalk? Are you putting in a sidewalk or what you're saying pedestrian improvements? Um, we're gonna be put wheelchair ramps on the sidewalk in the middle of the two way left turn lanes. We're gonna have the reference islands with um, uh, flashing mm. bacon that warning the drivers for passing pedestrians. So, so, council, so, I'm sorry, council President, if you're familiar with like the um, flashing pedestrian crossing on First Avenue or mm -hmm. over by 320th, yeah. it's installation of eight more locations of okay. the same oh, thing. So there's 88. Um, thank you. It wasn't clear with that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so there is sidewalk improvements associated with it, but the main goal is to provide crosswalks. Thank you. So this, so this would just be like at the, uh, the BPA trail where you cross 356, you got a crosswalk, you push the thing and the flasher goes. So exactly. the cars know you're coming by? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Or like, like the multiple ones along 320th then? So. Yeah. Well, one question I have, the, the ones along 320th, I mean, some of them are put in places that to me don't make sense in relation to where the bus stops are. And I go down 320th several times a day and I see people crossing other places instead of at the crosswalk which is stupid as I see it. However, uh, I mean, it's really stupid, you know, unless you're, you know, have a, you know, trying to commit suicide or something. Uh, but, but people do it because you're crossing, going way, you're, you're having to go way down from the intersection, cross, come way back to the bus stop. And yeah. it doesn't seem like they were put in the logical places so for crossing. Unfortunately, there's a couple of criteria and parameters that we have to look at when we install those. Um, so the bus stops is on the list, um, but first and foremost, it's where the driveways are and where all the turning movements from the side streets come out, and we have to be certain distances from all of those. So when we look at all of those different requirements, the number of places we can actually put them are, are, is fairly slim. So we have to identify where we can actually have them, and then we get into the conversation about bus stops. Um, to your point, yes, we see out of direction travel and we see people playing Frogger on occasion. Um, outside of putting in some sort of center median that forces people to cross at the crosswalks, though, we don't necessarily have a way to tell people that they can't cross the street. 
is, somewhere is else. It's a, illegal, but that doesn't yeah. stop them. Is there a way to work with Metro for them to relocate some of the bus stops for the safety of everything? I, we've tried in the past. We can certainly reach out again. Okay. Uh, with any of these, will there be similar situations with, uh, with any of these coming up? Not that I'm aware of, well, Jeff, if you're aware of any, but not, these are, these are more in response to where we've seen accidents with pet first car. Um, so this is kind of like round two of where they should be, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so this is more addressing kind of the same problems you're talking about with these locations. So there's none that we're aware of that are, I mean, we'd have to go back and look and get you exact distances on each one of them, but there's none that I'm aware of that are going to be as bad as some of the ones you're referencing. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Thank you. Uh, I, I do have, you have a question. Yeah. I do Go have ahead. A question. I thought you're going to make a motion real quick. And I, I will right <laughs> after this. So I noticed that, um, in this particular project, the conting contingency is 10%. The last project that John just presented at, uh, the contingency was at 15%. So when do we use a 10% and when do we use a 15%? I'm just curious. Um, so our standard is to use 10% unless there's a reason to change it. Um, so if we have a lot of unknowns, especially around right-of-way acquisition or, um, or it's early in the project, as John's project is, um, we tend to have a little higher of a contingency to be able to present an, a transparent answer to council. And then as the project um, gets refined, if we can reduce risk out of it, we lower the contingency. Um, but there are some projects that there's a lot more just unknowns, and the um, trail is one of the ones where we're not building completely in an in a, in a improved right-of-way, so there's a lot more risk with that. Um, the overlay project, we typically use 5%, where it's low risk. So there's a little bit of a I see. guess that goes with that. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 3rd, 2023 consent agenda for approval. I second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Now we'll move to uh, item, uh, what is it? F, 2020-2021 uh, Neighborhood Traffic Safety Program Project Acceptance. Um, Chair Dovey, committee members, council members, at this time, uh, I would like to present it to you the 2020 to 2021 Neighborhood Traffic Safety Program Project Acceptance to the committee. Um, there are five locations for this project. And the authorized maximum contract amount is $120,000. The construction contract, approximately $80,000, and with the remaining of $40,000. Uh, there are two options before committees are, and uh, the mayor uh, recommends option one be forward to December 21st, 2022, uh, CD Council Consent Agenda for approval and uh, staff is available for any questions you may have. So, so I have a question. Is the 40,000 just gonna roll over to the next, next year? I think for this project, it's gonna go back to uh, general funding. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And yes, Council Mayor Walsh. Yeah, and once again, could we go back to the map and just a little more explanation of which? Yeah, we might want bigger maps because we got <laughs> old and our eyes yeah. are starting to fade. There's, there's, they're totally unreadable to this on the screens up here. With, with, with the one, the upper left one, I think it said speed humps at 30th Avenue Southwest. Yes. Is, is that what had been previously discussed along uh, just the uh, west of, uh, of uh, Decatur? These are uh, the five speed hump that was put in on 30th and I believe it was uh, 19. Let me see if I can bring it uh, the, the map. Uh, I can I 
can get to uh, K drive, so I'm sorry. Could I suggest that the maps be put into the packets? I've asked before if we could do that. Um, it would be nice, you know, to be able to have that there. So, Jack. Uh, You're asking um, where the that actually those five speed zones okay, are. Okay, yeah, I, I think on that I I know where those are now. I'm trying to figure out where uh, some of the others are. Let me see if I can. can see ah, look at that technology. Hey. <laughs> there you go. Now you can look at it. <laughs> okay, second place. And extruded curbs, what, what are extruded curbs? Um, these are the extruded curb was put in last year at the ridge. No, what, what, what is an extruded curb? It's a, uh, it's a cement concrete curve um, around the island um, uh, that was put in uh, very recently. Oh, okay, the all right, so it's so around the, the island. Around the, 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 the uh, okay, all right. All right, I, I'm my safer there at now. So okay, thank you. Yeah, if it could be in the packet, it would be very helpful and save time up here. Okay, do I have a motion? Uh, yes, I I move to forward option one to the January 3, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, now we'll go to Military Road S Preservation Project. And remember to use that little thing to make the bat bigger. Like <laughs> <laughs> the mouse? Yeah, the mouse, you know, technology. He, he did really well on the last one when we asked. <laughs> At this time, I would like to present you, to you Military Road South Preservations Project 85% Design Status Report and Authorization to Bid. Uh, this project locates on Military Road South uh, between the South City Limits and, and South 320 uh, Streets. The estimated expenditure is approximately uh, $1.25 million and available funding also of uh, $1.25 million. Uh, staff anticipate bidding this project in uh, spring of 2023 and construction begins summer of 2023. Um, there are two options before committees um, and the mayor recommends option one be forward to uh, CD Council uh, December 21st, uh, 2022 CD Council uh, consent agenda for approval. And staff is available for any question you may have. Councilmember Walsh. Yeah, once again, let's go back to the map okay. so that we can see where, what we're talking about. I don't like ex okay. authorizing funding for something that I don't even know what it is. Um, All right, so basically this is from 320th to the uh, overpass on, on Highway 18. Yeah, it's um, a little bit north of SO18 to uh, Beasley Canyons and uh, South 320th Street. Okay, and what all does the project entail then? Uh, this is gonna be uh, pavement repair, uh, curb ramps, uh, design, uh, uh, curb ramp upgrades, and overlay. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, uh, um, just out of, thank you. Just out of curiosity, um, where is the city uh, boundary in that area? Is right. on uh, is right where the like, project begins, which is this line right here is the the boundary. 
And, and, it, and it runs along uh, Pisa Canyon? Yes. Uh, this oh, is, sure. the, uh, is running, this is the city boundary right here. Wow, thank you. Right there, yes. So this stops right at the bridge before you cross over, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Do I have a I motion? Have a question. Oh, oh yes, yeah, excuse me, Deputy did, Mayor Honda. Did you say that the city boundary runs down to right along Pisa Canyon Road? Yes, uh, this is um, the, see, you can see this line right here. I don't know if you can, can see, follow my, um, the, my uh -huh. mouse. Uh, this is the city right away. So, so are, are that, we so then responsible for trees that come down along Pisa Canyon? Not, no. not on no. uh, east of uh, military. East of, uh, the city boundary stops at 320th and uh, like around SO18. BC Canyon is, is in Auburn. This line right here is, is, on, is on Auburn. Hmm. Okay. The city of Auburn is responsible for trees that fall on the road through that section, not us. Okay, good to know. So the city boundary is just on the west, immediately on the west side of Pisa. Yeah, it starts the, southwest. It's the west right away line through there. Okay, all right. Uh, I um, I move to forward option one to the January 3, 2023 consent agenda for approval. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much. I thank you. Okay, we'll move to. Item H, which is 21st Avenue South and South 320th signalization and pedestrian improvements, 85% design. Good evening. Okay, uh, I am Ken Smith with the Public Arts Department. Good evening, I'm doing the 21st Avenue South and South 320th Signalization and Pedestrian Improvements 85 Design Report. So the project is to install signals, uh, pedestrian improvements, and uh, essentially a pedestrian crossing at the intersection of South 21st Street, 21st Avenue, and South 320th Street. Uh, this includes striping um, a center island, it's, it's kind of not as blacked out in this piece, but that in this section does include those improvements and uh, improving the um, improving the, the ramps on on the on each corner. Uh, let's see. There's a little bit about the project expenditures, um, and then the options can. The options considered, uh, one to authorize or two to not authorize and return. Uh, and the mayor recommends forwarding option one to the. Any questions? Could you go back to the map for a second? Sure. So this is a prime example based on Council Member Walsh's discussion where we can't teach pedestrians how to be smart. So just so we know, they're going to walk across 21st and then cross 320th and go across that little island and then cross uh, over to the mall is that correct yes so one i think i know where you're going with this one one thing that is included is is we're we haven't decided exactly what it will look like yet but there should be a small fence uh within right. the island to keep people a little bit better so, from just jumping it and running across this well, so my question is um i get the fence in the middle you know, mm -hmm. it's because you got busy track on both sides. But what about a some sort of blockade or a fence on the corner across the street where they start? If they start over by that bus stop that's on the left hand side, so they don't just come walking across 320th. I mean, does that make sense? What I'm saying? Because this this is right where that um, taco time is being redeveloped by the new place. Taco time will be the top right corner, correct? And if you go yeah. over the street so people don't say I'm just gonna walk across because I don't want to do the L shape or the are you, ta are you talking about like right in there yeah so 
one of our pedestrians who thinks I'm going to get there faster and cross from there right. over, are we going to have any safety there so it discourages them to walk out into that traffic? Sometimes there's like metal posts that have a sign on it that say crosswalk closed. Mm -hmm. that, so people are told not to go that direction. Again, we can only do our best job at directing yeah, we, people to the safe path. Yeah, I, I just been on the East Coast a lot of places where they have this kind of thing and they have a little two bars there so people know that not to walk across there. Yeah, so we can look at that. Um, there's some requirements around the crash attenuation that we're not putting an obstacle in the right of way. Yeah. But we can, we can, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, because this, um, the, we I, can take a look at it. I get the design is going to be changing people's uh, a little, pattern. a little bit, yes. Um, there's, it's going to take some getting used to, certainly. Um, you know, I think we need to get people away from crossing that left hand movement on the east side of it. Um, so we can certainly look at barricading off on the north side. And Council Mayor Walsh. Yeah, and, and this is where potentially there'll potentially there'll be the dip in the future, correct? Yes. Okay. And so so this would be anticipated to be built when? So it's I, I believe uh, we're working on essentially right away acquisition, but it's more securing easements or, or potentially right away acquisition for some of the south. Uh, once that occurs, it would go out to bid this this year and then construction following the only major thing holding it up would be acquiring the poles for the new signals so mm -hmm. okay and so it probably if if the dip comes to pass it I mean this may be functional for what five years maybe or I think it'll probably be longer than that that okay Ten. all right okay um, okay and, and what are uh, what are lift funds So LIFT is a program um, within the city core that we have designated that we get a um, million dollars per year to spend. It has to be within a defined LIFT area. Um, so the downtown core is designated, it was designated a couple of years ago, and we get a million dollars per year that has to be spent on infrastructure within the right of way in that box, um, and we get it, I believe, through 2030. Okay, and is that a grant or is that city? funds up from local city taxes going to it or house where, where's it, the lift fund what's the source of the lift funds state. Um, state it operates similar to a grant it's technically not a grant but um, yeah think of it in terms of a grant but we get money from the state for it so basically the, the what we would be paying would be the the the, the read and the mitigation uh, traffic impact fees would be the stuff to be directly coming out of the city budget. Correct, and some of that mitigation fees is designated to this area from projects that have been built right there, um, so they can't be reallocated somewhere else. Okay, all right, thank you. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you, could you please, oops, could you please send me this map? I'd like to look at it in more detail. It's really hard to, to read it on here. Sure. Thank you. Okay, do I have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I move to forward option one to the January 3rd, 2023 consent agenda for approval. I second the motion. Okay, it's been a moved and seconded. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Okay, now we'll go to the target demolition. This should be a fun one. So I got good news for you. I Great. don't have a map in here. Uh, it's, no it's, maps. Okay. And, and it's a no big, map. Could you let us know where the project is? No. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's a big target. Yeah. <laughs> it is a big target. Um, so, uh, good evening. For the purpose of the record, my name is EJ Walsh. I'm the Public Works Director. Uh, before you tonight is uh, follow up on a previous conversation that we've been having with Council around ARPA. Um, this was. Um, originally included in the list of items for ARPA funding that the council saw. Um, as the council deliberated on it, it was pulled out of that list and we were tasked with providing some additional research and then coming back to council. So that research has been done and we are here. Um, so with one exception as we flip through this presentation, all of these pictures are from the last three weeks. And I will tell you which one is not from the last three weeks when we get to it. So the property history, um, 
given this one, this presentation's slightly longer than our standard ones, but not much. Um, the city did purchase this parcel in 2014. Um, we had been working with a previous developer on it um, and have been involved with this parcel for a lot longer than that, but officially it came into city ownership in 2014. In 2014, as part of that acquisition, we did have an estimate completed by a demolition company to demolish the building and turn it effectively into a parking lot. Um, that cost in 2014 was $250,000. In 2019, we had an appraisal done as part of the sale to the hotel that we ultimately took back. At that time, the cost to do the work was $385,000, same scope of work. 2022, we were asked to update that. We went and walked it with the same demolition company from 2014, um, and their unofficial bid came back at $600,000. This will need to go through a formal bidding process, um, so hopefully you know, we will get them more competitive than that. Um, but that that is the market history on this project. When you look at CPI and everything else, the numbers make sense. Um, as far as the scope of work goes, it does include complete raising of the building, uh, removal of all the non-functional light poles. All the copper was stolen out of the light poles in the parking lot before the city took possession of that building. So there are just giant steel poles there. The lights do not work. Um, it does keep the existing paved areas paved. We are not demolishing the pavement or the curbing or the landscaping. Um, so all of that will remain under this proposal. The first request we got, there were two requests we got from council. So the first was to have a third party appraiser look at the property and what the cost implications of demolishing the building versus keeping it would be. Um, we used the same appraiser that did the work when we acquired the property in 2014, which is the same appraiser that did the work when uh, we sold a portion of the property to the hotel in 2019. Um, so they are familiar with the property. Um, their findings, the entire report is in the council packet, um, but their findings, the summary it, uh, in the closing of the report is what's in italics is their findings is the market value of the former target property will be increased by no less than the market cost to demolish the property. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, and in conversation, this was the part that they really um, hammered home with me personally, is that by demolishing the building, this, this parcel is much more attractive to potential buyers. There's a couple of reasons. Most of them are in the report. Some of them are not. Um, but the big one is reduction in risk to the potential buyer. And that comes in a couple of different forms. It comes in the risk that we all associate with and the pictures that you're seeing throughout this presentation, someone breaking in and then being required to secure the building. It also comes with, they've just made a large purchase. You know, they spent a lot of money buying the property from the city. They then have to go through the development process and have a period of time while they're working on permitting, you know, even if they know what they want to do while they're working on the final design and permitting of the property and all their entitlements, that they don't know what the market does. So at a best case scenario, they only have to pay CPI, and that's not a significant number from where they are today. But with just buying the property, most lenders aren't going to front demolition of the building until they have a plan in place for what they want to do. So they have a lot of exposure to market right there with those costs, and that is translated directly into risk, which we can expect to see reflected in the price they are willing to pay for the property. Um, it's also more marketable without the building for many of the same reasons that we have um, been talking about, the break-ins, the securing it, trash abatement, and everything else that goes with that property. Um, taking that off the table as far as the developer goes makes it more attractive to them. It also allows them to do a little bit more speculative development because that building's not in the way. So the second cost that we got is to, and with all of those findings being pretty clear cut, um, we, we did complete this per council's request, but we did not spend a ton of time pinning down exact dollars. Um, so the summary of ongoing costs, there are principally four departments that spend time associated with this property. Parks by far spends the most, then police, then public works, then community development. Um, so this table is in the uh, re in the agenda bill that you have. Um, and what you are seeing is times weekly is the number of times we typically perform this work on a weekly basis. And you can see there's a whole laundry list of departments and different groups that are doing it. Monthly, this is in addition. So on, an, on a monthly basis, we go out and basically do even more. And then quarterly, we do above both of those two. Um, so Parks is out there inspecting it 
um, typically once a week. It takes a combined three hours per week to do that. Trash abatement, they're doing about twice a month for a combined eight hours. Landscaping is about two hours a month. Mowing is about two hours a month. Securing the building, we do about twice a month. Um, you saw, you're seeing a lot of pictures associated with that. That's about 16 hours of uh, labor per month associated with that. Police um, respond to the property typically three times a week, encompassing typically it's two officers responding. So it's, this is four hours per officer per week. Public works, we are out there routinely helping the parks department, whether it's with security or with, or sorry, not security, with securing the building um, or bringing out additional equipment and providing labor. Trash abatement, we're also out there. Landscaping, we are out there on a quarterly basis as well. Um, mowing, community development, they're inspecting it. This is graffiti and shopping carts. And then the abatement that goes with that. What we did for the purpose of um, trying to get to a number and not spending a ton of time um, making the finance department pick through the weeds knowing it's the end of the year, was we combined all of these hours and got to 322 hours of labor that the city is expending on a quarterly basis. We know this is really low, which is why we used it, but we used a maintenance worker too, which is a union position. So this is um, basically our staff that's performing the work. This is not leads, and this is well below the police officer rate. Um, and what we did is we used that rate, which equates to about $46 an hour, if I remember correctly. The number is actually in the staff memo. Um, and it equates to about $15,000 in labor that we are spending um, on a quarterly basis. And we spend, it's a little over $61,000 using that same rate, which is low. Um, and then all the materials, whether it's paint for graffiti abatement, whether it is additional hardware or welding rods to weld doors back closed, none of that is in this number. So uh, ballpark, um, it is fairly safe to say the city is spending in excess of 100 grand per year if we were to apply the correct rates. So the options considered is to authorize staff to solicit bids, um, to not authorize staff, and then the mayor recommends option one. And this is the one picture that is about six months old. Um, so this is the one picture from not, not within the last three weeks. Um, and this was, they had broken in through the roof, and this was how they were climbing down inside the building. With that, I am happy to answer any questions. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Um, when you talk about landscaping, what landscaping are you talking about? Um, so there's a couple different sets of landscaping out there. Um, typically, the Parks Department handles this stuff within the site. So it is a lot of picking up trash, a lot of um, going in with weed whackers. It is definitely not ornamental landscaping in the parking lot itself. Public Works handles pretty much the um, area that will be on the east side of the building from the building to the right-of-way line up there where all the pine trees are, as well as the south side, um, kind of across from the Sound Transit parking garage through there. Um, so by landscaping, it's typically chainsaws, backhoes, and weed whackers, not, you know, fine mowing. Um, but that, it's that. And that's done twice a month? Yeah. Um, and secondly, when would you expect that this work would be done? So the goal is to go out to bid as soon as possible. Um, realistically, just looking at the time of year, that will probably be after the first of the year and come back to council for authorization to award and have it, ideally have it start demolition as soon as the weather breaks mid spring. Okay. Um, my, my request would be that if there is something big happening at the Performing Arts Center, that it not be torn down during that weekend or sure, you know, that you work around that so that we present the very best face to the public coming to the to the pack so, absolutely thank you we can coordinate that with them council member walsh i uh i move to for the proposed option one uh to authorize oh no no hold on that's the yeah, yeah. i moved committee recommend yeah I move to forward the option one, authorize staff to solicit bids for the demolition of the former target building using ARPA funds, returning for the authorization to award the project to the lowest responsive 
responsible bidder to the January 3, 2023 consent agenda, agenda for approval. I'll second that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. And can I just make one comment? Can you do it as fast as possible? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, now we'll move to ordinance compost procurement per HB 1799 organic management law. That sounds fun. Good evening. Uh, my name is Colleen Minion, and I am the Public Education Outreach Supervisor within the Environmental Services Division within Public Works. And I'm here to talk to you about a new ordinance, the Compost Procurement per HB 1799, otherwise known as the Organics Management Law. Uh, earlier this year, the Washington State Legislature passed House Bill 1799. And within this law, it includes a requirement for cities greater than 25,000 in population to adopt a compost procurement ordinance. The state law is focusing on reducing methane emissions by diverting organics from landfills. And they're actually setting a goal of reducing landfilling of organic wastes by 75% by the year 2030. And uh, they're doing this uh, by focusing on uh, changing and amending 20 plus RCWs. <laughs> and that's gonna look at prevention, collection, processing, and the markets relating to organics. The adoption of the city ordinance is relatively a minor component of this law. Um, they are focusing on many different aspects, which include, but aren't limited to, updating compostable packaging specifications. There will be a new statewide agency, which will be called the Center for Sustainable Food Management. They're also updating Good Samaritan laws regarding food donation, which will increase edible food diversion. The organics management law requires the city to adopt an ordinance which will ensure the city will use compost products in a variety of projects. These projects will include landscaping projects, construction soil amendments, applications to prevent erosion, filter stormwater runoff, promote vegetation growth, or to improve stability and longevity of roadways. It will also uh, be included in low impact development and green infrastructure projects. Also included in the ordinance is that the compost products must meet three criteria. Um, they must meet standards, they, it must be reasonably priced, and also available locally. Also, we will be required to report on our compost use. Uh, reports will be due to the Washington State Department of Ecology by December 31st, 2024, and every two years thereafter. And the city will also provide outreach, highlighting the benefits of compost use in our operations. In terms of financial impacts, uh, it should be nominal. Um, routine procurement of compost product material uh, will be included in ongoing maintenance or in applicable projects, as has regularly occurred over time. The required reporting will be streamlined to minimize staff time, and the required outreach uh, perfectly meshes with our uh, already occurring outreach uh, that is funded by recycling grants. The requested action is for the LUTC to forward the proposed ordinance to the January 3rd, 2023 City Council agenda for first reading. Councilmember Walsh. Yeah, uh, going back to the, uh, the financial impact page. Yes. Uh, kind of unique for financial impacts with generally on the financial impact page there's some numbers mm -hmm. on this there are no numbers <laughs> any guesstimates of what it in reality this is going to cost the city 
I do not have any specific guesstimates on that. No, it looks we, like it'll be some ongoing cost, okay. not just a one-time cost, but a ongoing. Correct. We did not put together what the cost to do this is. This is a state mandated. It's an unfunded mandate, to your point. Yeah. Um, and it got thrown out to us pretty late in the game, and we have to have it approved by December 31st. So we've spent most of the time trying to comply with the state regulations first doing analysis to try, figure out what the true impacts are. Um, we use compost throughout our, our maintenance and operation, as does parks today. Um, so most of this comes with documentation more so than new purchases, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, maybe on our legislative agenda we could add one more thing saying, hey, these unfunded mandates, we need, we need funding and not have unfunded mandates. I, not that it would go very far, but at least a rise, raise a, a, the concern that if the legislature is going to do something, they need to fund it for us. Sure. I can pass that on to Steve McKnight. Okay. Thank you. Council, Pre Council President Kosmar. I'm putting that on right now in the funded mandate for legislative agenda. So uh, three questions. First one is, um, is there, it doesn't specify where we're supposed to, we don't have any composting uh, within our city limits, correct? We go outside our city limits to get compost. The, the manufacturer is outside of our city mm -hmm. limits, correct? So, so the requirement, there isn't any requirement that it be within your city limits, it, it's just buying compost. So would we be using compost in, instead of um, fill material? or? regular dirt or are we just I mean we already use compost for right we already use compost and and really the available locally that's I, I suppose somewhat subjective as well because that's the standard it has to meet is that it's available locally so but. so I'm trying to understand how this is going to work so we have an agency that they are proposing to create at the state mm -hmm. so this agency then is going to oversee all these compost purchases I mean I mean literally I'm trying to understand how the the, the new statewide agency is going to be focusing on um, uh, like sustainable f food practices and waste diversion um, and they pr I would assume they would also encompass the overseeing compost so uh, they're procurement. requiring this mandate but they're not saying how they're are they saying how they're going to enforce it no uh-huh so um, but they're requiring that we provide documentation. Yes. And that's where our unfunded mandate comes in because it's extra paperwork for us. Is there any other part for the unfunded mandate that we would be concerned about other than the paperwork? Um, no, the, I, I believe the, the outreach requirement, I think that that can easily be absorbed because we do a lot of outreach already about compost and its benefits. Mm -hmm. So any statistics that we gather through reporting, we can just include with our already happening outreach. Well, so obviously for us, it's not going to affect us that much, but probably smaller cities across the street are going to have a, across the state will probably have a problem. Well, they ha there's, uh, the cities have to meet two criteria uh, to be part of, to, I guess, um, yeah, start an ordinance. They have yeah. to be over 25,000, and they also have to have um, organics collection available to them. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Thanks for bringing this up. This was discussed extensively at the last PIC meeting at SCA. So I was going to write an email and I forgot because I got really busy, but thank you very much. Um, I, I'm going to make an assumption, which could be wrong, that this is the same ordinance that most cities are using throughout King County. Everyone's, uh, yeah, Using it's very one. similar. Okay. There are definitely Language. some, yeah, it's, there are definitely some similarities. There isn't a, an official model ordinance that cities have the ability to copy. There are some examples out there, though. Okay, thanks very much. So, so my question is, for the last 20 years, anyway, we've been encouraging people to put pizza boxes and grass and things into these bins that waste management picks up. 
and that always goes to the compost place or the landfill. And now we're going to try to dis discourage people from that kind of pickup, or no? I mean, it seems the, the counterproductive purpose, in a way. Well, the purpose of um, I suppose mandating and creating the ordinances is to create a market because there's if they want to, it's a pretty aggressive agenda to try to decrease organics to be landfilled by 75% yeah, within like eight years. And so they are, the state is going to be aggressively pushing education and outreach regarding um, organics uh, and recycling, I suppose. Um, and because of that, they need to create a market for like, okay, they're, everyone's making compost now, who's gonna buy it? And so <laughs> they're, they're creating okay. markets. That's one of the Maybe we should uh, start a compost pile and sell it. We <laughs> <laughs> yeah. New business in federal way. So this pretty much goes hand in hand with what you're saying. So yeah. there's been a, a concerted effort to push compost on the residential side of put it in your bin and send it away to a facility to make compost. Yeah. This is kind of taking it full circle of once the compost is made, having the communities actually buy it back to yeah. put wherever, be it on a residential house, the right of way, whatever. So, so this is the first step where they're trying to keep it local effectively so that cities are more or less purchasing something comparable to the amount they're generating. So, so all the compost we've been sending off to our trash people, now we're f making it so we're forced to buy it back from them? Pretty much. So we, the, the three big ones are the ones going to make all the money? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so waste management does not process those themselves. Yeah, well, anyway, whoever processes it now has a market that they didn't have. That is correct. Okay. Okay, do I have a motion to have uh, this okay. state mandate mandated? <laughs> okay, I move to forward the proposed ordinance to the first reading on January 3rd, 2023. I second it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we're going to item K, I believe it is, yes, chapter 8.3, weight and load regulations. Good evening, committee, members of the council. I'm Cole Elliott. I'm the development specialist. Nice tie. Nice tie. Thank you. Uh, I'm here to request a new chapter, actually, in the Federal Way Revised Code. The policy question we have, the question before you, is should we amend 840.030 and adopt the new chapter 843? establishing weight and load restrictions within the city. The city has been experiencing a market increase in the oversized and overweight loads, especially this year, I will say. What we have tried to do is come up with a cooperative effort with the heavy haulers to minimize the wear and damage on the city streets and the infrastructure. We've had a little bit of infrastructure hit two and three times at the same location. Uh, through permitting, we can then be able to assess the risk, and if anything is damaged, establish the legally responsible personnel or party. The mayor's recommendation is to amend 840 and adopt chapter 843, and if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Um, what kind of damage are we seeing now? I, the pictures you show were sound transit, which is kind of a one-time thing. So, I mean. We've had several poles hit and street signs that we've had to replace. And until we started the complete enforcement of it, 
we were scrambling to find the responsible party. And to give you an example, yeah, in 2021, we only issued two oversized permits. In 2022, to date, we've issued 71. Are, the, are those generally from sound transit oriented? Things? Actually, it's across the board. Um, we've had Lake Haven, uh, we had to issue several there, IRG, uh, first and 348. The heavy equipment is moving in and out of the city with the redevelopment. Okay. So. Councilmember Walsh. You, you said it was uh, uh, most infrastructure damage. Was, was, it one, was it one location? Where, where was that? We've had a couple strikes. Uh, we had a boat strike, one of the signal heads at first and 356th and we've had some signs on one of the haul routes that tore down uh, from loads on military road those are the ones that come to mind ej may know of a couple others yeah 312th has been hammered pretty hard from pack highway to military um, this last year um, and the one thing I would add to this is, so we have weight and load restrictions in place today um, that have been in place since the early 90s. Um, and the process is, I'll say, not super clear currently. So this came out of industry actually coming to us and asking us to clarify some of our requirements and to have a more streamlined process. So we, um, the mayor and myself and our city attorney sat down with um, a couple of the trucking companies as well as a, represent or a, a lobbying group that represents all of them. Um, and they pointed us to in the direction of what Bellevue has adopted that they thought was a little easier to work with and provided clarity for everybody, both for them and for the city. Um, so we updated the code that Bellevue had adopted many years ago to work for the city, but it's it's based on that same model that industry requested clarity around. So it's more clarifying things rather than... So there's a lot of new requirements in there um, that, that they were agreeable to, but it um, a lot of it is around definitions of... Um, our code previously said oversize is just what's defined by WashDOT. Um, whereas the new code actually goes into what that means um, and it also establishes what can be used on different roads. So it allows them to kind of put their hauling plans together without as much input for us and kind of show us a final version as opposed to having to start with a meeting to figure out what we would allow and then start designing their routes. Um, so, but yeah, it, I mean, it's definitely turning a couple paragraphs into two or three pages. So it's it is adding. I don't want to sugarcoat that. So will this help reduce staff time on our part then? Yes, that's that's okay. part of the goal. Okay, and probably reduce headache on the on the haulers part. To... On on the hauling company's yes. part specifically, yes. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Deputy Mayor Honda. No, oh, thank you. So, um, what is the permit fee currently? I believe the annual permit this year is $184, ma'am. Per trip? No, ma'am. For the year. For the year. Calendar year. Yes. So, and we have we had 71 of those permit fees? and. Yes, ma'am. And that just goes into the general fund? Yes, ma'am. So, if something is damaged, how do you know who damaged it? We look at the records of what permits were issued and the routes that they take. That's part of the submission for the permit. And typically what we do is our right-of-way inspectors drive the route before the haul, and then we make an effort to get back there typically within 24 hours of the load to rerun the route to see if there's any damage. If we find any, we contact them and we start at that point. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Walsh. Are, are there many occurrences of, of, uh, of, peop of companies not getting the permits that they should have and just uh, playing loose with it? We do have a few, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have some very above board haulers, but uh, the strike on the signal from a boat hauler 
was an unpermitted and we used the traffic cameras to track them down and contact them that way. So uh, the record so far in amongst the right-of-way inspectors is five illegal permit haulers in one day. Wow, and, and what kind of fine is there for that? Uh, it's a no notice fine. It's $279 for the incident, plus we make them get the annual permit. Okay. Yeah, almost seems like that should be higher. Yeah, so I, we're not changing any of the fees as part of this. So the fees are already established as part of the fee schedule. So none of that is changing as part of this ordinance. Yeah. So if council wants to adjust the fees, certainly we can do that whenever the fee schedule, yeah. I'm not sure when finance is bringing it to you, but. Um, that can be adjusted, but those fees are in place today and not changing. Yeah, I mean, it seems as though, I mean, not necessarily the fee, but the fine for not uh, not getting the, the permit. The non-compliance fee is non part of the fee yeah. schedule as right. well. It, um, is some of the non-compliance because people are trying to avoid the way station coming up 99? No, it's no. been closed for quite a while. Well, uh, typically, it is either lack of information on their part, or a lot of them claim that since they've gotten the wash dot permit, they have the right to drive on all streets. Yeah. Okay. Deputy Mayor Honda. Uh, thank you. So do they get a citation then when they damage something that goes against their driving record in the company? Typically, no. What we do is we contact the company and try to work out the uh, replacement of whatever was damaged it goes against their insurance and so do the the fees that we charge are they um the same amounts that other cities in this area charge they're comparable to bellevue we didn't i since the fees were already part of the fee schedule we did not do a com okay. full compliance as part of this um We do regional comparisons every other year to make sure that we're in comparison with everybody else around us. Thank you. Uh, dip, uh, excuse me, Council President. Coach Thank Martin. you. I'm, I'm just wondering um, if you've had any trouble getting the insurance companies or, or the companies themselves to pay for the damages. Typically, the first answer is it wasn't us. It couldn't have been. Mm -hmm. uh, but luckily we do have extensive traffic cameras and since the inspectors typically drive these routes regularly uh, the argument ends quickly yeah I would assume that the person uh, who, who caused the damage would behoove them in their own best interest to deny because that would go against their driving record with the company which then would put them in jeopardy of losing their job um, so I would think that there might be a, a problem with that so I was just curious to see how many of these are actually resolved amicably we honestly I can't think of any that we haven't solved oh great yeah there's been a couple trees that have gotten knocked down that we were unsuccessful resolving but all of the hardened infrastructure we've um, risk has led the charge on that so Kent's department law um, but we have gotten resolution on all of the hard infrastructure. Councilor Walsh. Yeah. I move to forward the proposed ordinance to first reading on January 3, 2023. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Now we're going to go to ordinance planning commission code amendments. Good evening, committee chair, Dovey, council members, Tran and Walsh. Uh, council president, Coach Mar, Deputy Mayor Honda, council member Norton and council member Sefa Dawson, Keith Niven, planning manager. Um, so this evening, uh, the first agenda item I have is um, an amendment to, uh, a proposed amendment to chapter 2.90 of the Federal Way Revised Code. That is a uh, um, title and chapter re relating to the Planning Commission. And what this proposed amendment would do would be to allow for alternate members of the commission to serve as full members for the purposes of 
uh, meeting quorum requirements. So right now, as you know, we have seven regular members, we have three alternates, um, but if we don't have four full members for any com commission meeting, uh, they do not have a quorum even if those alternates are in attendance. And so what this does is allows the alternates to function as a full member um, which would allow us to make quora more often than not. And w given the amount of work we have in front of the Planning Commission, um, we see this as being kind of a vital change for our code. So that is the uh, extent of this first one. No presentation other than that. Um, but I'll ramp it up as we move on to the next ones. Councilman, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda, you get to ask the first question. Well, thank you. Uh, so I don't have a, a problem with this, but I, if we do it for this commission, I would like to see it done for all commissions. So I don't know who needs to know that information. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm laughing because I uh, appreciate that comment. That, um, if you notice in your packet, there's some actually odd dates referenced about when there was originally a hearing with respect to this. I believe it was 2021. And the reason for that is we actually put a pause on this amendment specifically in the hopes of, in the meantime, um, doing this for all of the commissions and making it consistent across the board and standardizing our language because at the moment, if you look through our code, it's basically different for every commission and there's a ton of differences. Um, unfortunately, that has not occurred yet. And so we are back now with the planning commission specific one, but that is a priority for, okay. for, um, for amendment. I appreciate that because this can happen to any commission where they don't have enough of the vote voting members and alternates sometimes think that they get to move up into that position if the voting member is not there and, and we just can't allow it because of the ordinance. So, so I would like to see it consistent. Thank you. Councilmember Walsh, your turn. Yeah, I, I would say that to me this is a no-brainer and, and it seems that as uh, Deputy Mayor Honda said, I mean, we need to, I mean, take care of this now and then get it fixed with all of them. I mean, it, it seems like it only makes sense that that should be one of the primary purposes of an alternate member is to be able to fill in to, to make a quorum if, if needed. And so, so anyway, it would be my hope that we'd be able to very soon implement that across the board with the commissions. So, so my comment, I'm going to be the naysayer. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think this is a poor thing to do. Um, I understand we have to have quorums to vote, but we choose people as a council for people to be voting members. And now if we're going to say all alternates are voting members, then why wouldn't we just change it to make everybody a voting member instead of in an emergency an alternate can vote? I think we're sending the wrong message. So it's but, a no, it's a numbers game, unfortunately, because if if you if you if you make all those three alternates full members, now you've got ten, so yeah. now your quorum is six, and so you're chasing. You actually have an advantage uh, keeping it the way it is because the quorum now is only four, yeah. um, and you have these three others that potentially can substitute in to make the four. So, so it's a numbers game. Yeah. How how often have we had the issue where we couldn't vote? Uh, this year, uh, it happened once, um, but last year, it, it happened more frequently. Um, so it does happen, and what happens is because, uh, especially with the Planning Commission, we have one or two agenda items twice a month, every month, except for they, they got three meetings off this year, and they're having a special meeting next week. Um, it's full and so to miss one it bumps everything um, and that becomes a problem and I and I'd go on and emphasize that it's it's not just for voting purposes it's the ability to hold the meeting in the first place so when we don't have a quorum ever the people who are there show up we realize we don't have a quorum then everyone goes home and there's just no discussion whatsoever can, can uh, do they get to have quorum on zoom also just like council does yes they do or at least they did actually that may be outdated information. I believe Zoom was an option up until a few months ago, and it is no longer an option, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure on that off the top and, of my head. And, and why is Zoom not an option now? Is it? Uh, I think, as I understand it, and I don't want to speak for the IT department who's behind that mirrored screen over there, but I, I believe um, we don't have the capacity to um, 
I, I believe it's a capacity staff and resources question rather than it not being a good idea but but council we can have zoom people can come in on zoom but we haven't we just don't have the bandwidth to have it at the at the the other level my understanding is that's the case similar to how we don't record or broadcast those committee or excuse me commission meetings over the YouTube Deputy Member Honda, you have a question? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, so we have three alternates, correct, on the Planning Commission. So will it be named as to what alternate will be the voting member? If they, I, Just to make it clear, so there's no confusion at the meeting that what alternate would step into the voting position. Yeah, we've been waiting for this code amendment to happen. Um, the, the understanding that staff has with the Planning Commission is when this code, if this code gets approved, we need to then go into the commission rules and amend the commission rules to be explicit about how the chair will select which alternate uh, gets to be bumped up for a particular meeting when, it, when quorum is necessary, so. Okay, thanks. So, it, it, uh, Council Mayor, President it, Kofar. It would appear to me that that should be, I would just suggest by seniority by the person who'd been there the longest or have them agree, you know, if they're two, same. But, um, yeah, I, I, I was going to ask how it would be determined who the voting one would be also. Uh, but kind of in, in uh, response to your concern with the alternates, I mean, perhaps if we're doing this, we need to be make sure that we are being uh, more prudent on who we appoint at alternates in the future rather than, I mean, I think there's been at times when we thought, well, hey, we'll just make them alternate. You know, they, they, they can't do any harm. We'll just make them alternate. Where perhaps with this, perhaps we shouldn't have uh, made them an alternate to begin with. Yeah. Well, I'll just, I'll probably vote against this just as from, a, <laughs> from a philosophy standpoint, I just think it's wrong. But if you point alternates, I mean, we're talking about m bumping an alternate up and we're talking about seniority and they both get appointed at the same time. So there is no seniority. We're now putting the planning commission, whoever's in charge, of which of this two people am I going to point that are here? I don't know. I, I It's kind of like, you know, you vote six council members or seven council members and we're going to have an alternate over there because one of them can't show up someday, so we put them in a voting position. Not that we would do that, but I just, I get it for the process of getting work done. I just have a philosophy that if we appoint somebody and then now we're bumping them up, I, don't, I have a hard time with that, but that's fine. <laughs> that's just me. So do I have a motion? Yeah, I would still propose. Because you don't want me to I, make I, the motion. Because <laughs> I'm not going to vote for I, it. I move to forward the proposed ordinance to first reading on 1-3-2023. So since and it's I, going as a proposed uh, first that. reading yeah. rather than, it, than consent yeah, agenda, yeah. we can. No, know, we can do it consent agenda. That's no, just, I mean, it's not consent agenda anyway. It's okay, reading, so, so I have a, a, a motion to uh, move this. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Nay. <laughs> <laughs> But it passed two to one, so we'll move on to the next thing. So, oh, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay, Chair Doby. I just would like to just interject that I think Councilmember Walsh came up with a, 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 a good suggestion, which is we have to be more careful about some of the alternates that we appoint because our philosophy has been to appoint everybody. Yeah. I always thought we worked uh -huh. kind and of to uh, be, um, that way. As inclusive as we can, but maybe we need to be more selective in certain instances. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> Uh, this will always be fun. Sign code ordinance. I remember years battling this thing for years. So, so <laughs> I, I always like sign code amendments. Sign codes. You, you never touch the sign code unless you have to. Yeah, I know. Because um, as much as you think it's a good idea, it's uh, always fraught with a little bit of... Uh, you got a good sign there in the picture, though. I like that. All right, so uh, still Keith Niven, uh, part of a doubleheader. Um, this evening, uh, we have a proposed amendment to Title 19, which is uh, iconic signs. Are they moving to Federal Way? 
Um, I would be awesome. Are you telling us that they're We're going to give them that sign anywhere they want? <laughs> All right, easy. <laughs> so purpose, uh, the iconic sign provision is intended to create a process whereby a proposed sign that does not meet the dimensional or other standards of the sign code, but through design and artistic expression unrelated to its message is culturally significant to the community or region and is expected to serve a placemaking function either upon completion or with the passage of time. This provision is not intended to be a tool to vary one or more of the standards of this chapter, simply to allow for a larger sign than otherwise could be obtained. All right, that's the purpose. All right, so here's examples of signs that I would consider being iconic signs. To, and iconic signs to the Northwest. So for example, part of the way we're crafting this code is, you know, the golden arches are an iconic sign. Um, almost everybody knows what the McDonald's M looks like, right? But it's not significant to the Pacific Northwest. It did not start here and is not. But, but Pink Elephant, Ivar's, uh, uh, Pike Place, Dick's, Starbucks, um, these are um, businesses, and even the Portland, Oregon sign is, is, I think, significant to the Pacific Northwest. So the criteria here is cannot be for residential. So no multifamily, no single family. This is just for commercial. It needs to be regionally significant. Uh, we're going to limit this if the council approves this. We're limiting it to the city center. And part of this is, again, to try and use some other design elements to create some character to the area that we're really focusing on at this time. Um, it needs to meet the goals and policies of the comp plan, uh, quality materials, serves a placemaking function, enhances the streetscape or identity of the city center, is not favoritism to a particular property or business, is appropriately scaled with the building, there are limits on the lighting, it's safe and it's not a billboard, and by billboard means it's not an off-premise sign. All right, so here are your code criteria for code amendments. Uh, proposed amendment bears substantial relationship to the public health, safety, and welfare. Proposed amendment is in the best interest of the residents of the city. And the proposed amendment is consistent with the requirements of 3670A with the portion of, uh, of the city's adopted plan not affected by the amendment. All right, so the Planning Commission held a public hearing on November 2nd. Uh, the city received no comments uh, from the public, nor were there any people speaking at uh, the public hearing, um, and the Planning Commission recommended approval of the proposed code amendment. Uh, the mayor also recommends approval of the proposed code amendment. And with that, I'm going to ask if you have any questions. You, you don't happen to have a map of where these signs are going <laughs> to go, do you? Um, you know, obviously, um, this is one of those things that uh, we may get none, uh, we may get a lot, or we may get somewhere in between, and, and you just don't know. And I think part of this is we're trying to open the box a little bit to allow for some cool signs without it looking like the strip um, or somewhere else that you may not uh, particularly care for aesthetically. So this is, again, I think signs, if done well, can serve as kind of that kind of urban place making function that we're really trying to develop in our city center, which is one of the reasons why we're proposing to limit this code amendment to the city center as a start. Um, and if this goes horribly awry, um, we may end up with one that we don't like and then we can shut the door again. Um, I don't think so. I think the criteria, that, there are not a lot of similar codes to this uh, across our country. Uh, but I did find a few, um, and then uh, definitely incorporated some of the criteria that, that they had for our proposed code. So can I ask one question, then your turn? So we have, you had on the picture here Dick's sign. I did. And they're coming in building right now. If this was not passed, could they put their sign up on their new building by the mall? Uh, they could put a sign up. Well, um, that was not my question. I know they could put a sign up. Could they put the iconic Dick sign up? No. 
Okay, but if we pass this, then they could. Yes. If it, and who is the? Well, we passed the code, so it just says you could. Just to clarify, I don't think it's an absolute yes that they could put that sign there. Once we've and I'm not saying the sign. I'm criteria. not saying the sign's yeah. bad. I'm just trying. We spent years on Highway 99 taking iconic signs down, and spent a lot of money and got sued and, you know, it was a. I don't know. Skip Priest is the mayor. I think it was his whole life back when he was on the council, <laughs> on the sign code. So now all of a sudden, I don't have a problem with iconic signs, but we're putting it back into place. Uh, more purposely, um, uh, hopefully. Well, purposely, but somebody's got to make the decision what's purposely, right? Yes. Um, okay. Okay, yeah. Deputy Mayor Honda, you've got your Thank you. Mic. So I was going to ask about Dick's, too, and their sign. So this would have to be a business that is from the Northwest? Yes. That was started here and could be a national business, but it has to have started here? No, not under the current formulation. It has to be a business that's been found in the city and or region for a minimum of 20 years. You, you said founded in the Northwest? Found. Found. So Chase Bank could be found in the Northwest it would meet, and they could change their sign? Uh, it would meet that, well, potentially it would meet that one of many criteria. And who will decide if the sign would be allowed? Is that the Planning Commission that would come to the council or would it be staff? Uh, this is an administrate. This is suggested to be an administrative decision. Um, I mean, I would have to agree with Councilmember Dovey. I remember the years I wasn't on council, but I was trying to get a sign at Sahali Junior High School, and I we couldn't. The PTA couldn't because there was already two signs there, and um, I remember fighting for just a little reader board for our school. And, uh, you know, we went nowhere until someone who was drunk hit one of the big signs that said City Park and knocked it down in size, and then the reader board was allowed. So, um, so just to clarify one thing that the assistant city attorney said, because I'm not sure I agree with it, is um, under criteria B, uh, it says the proposed iconic sign is representative of a business that has been founded in the city. Uh, that has been found in the city and or region a minimum of 20 years. So that is what he said. Um, but there is also a criteria um, that is criteria E that says the proposed iconic sign through design and or artistic expression uh, unrelated, to its message, unrelated to its message is significant to the community or region. So that's the Pacific Northwest piece that I think is connected. So that gets back to the thing I said about McDonald's earlier. McDonald's has been around for 20 years. Um, but as far as I know, there's no uh, regional significance to McDonald's in the Pacific Northwest. Now, maybe somebody can tell me otherwise, um, but I don't know that there is. I would just, I, my opinion is I think this needs to come to council if there's a, a, a sign that's different than is accepted in other places in town that it should come to, for council approval instead of um, having staff decide. Not that staff doesn't make good decisions, but it's going to be questioned by other people in the community. And I, I think it's something that it's our responsibility as council. If anyone wants that responsibility. You know, I personally, having been through the sign wars in Federal Way, <laughs> think this is really dumb. <laughs> I mean, not dumb. I like the signs. Don't get me wrong. But I just think we're opening ourselves up for a whole bunch of problems and decisions and who's, who's Northwest and who's signs right. And, you know, I don't know. It was, it was all time consuming when we took all the signs down on 99 and had to pay money to get everybody to conform and now we're going back retro kind of I don't know I just I think it's something I don't want to fight in the future when somebody says how come I can't put the sign up on my corner 
Well, and as a suggestion um, to uh, the deputy mayor's suggestion, another choice could be the hearing examiner. Um, if the council wants to stay out of this, um, you know, the criteria are the criteria. And, you know, if the council feels like there's wants to be a little bit more public exposure to those decisions, because right now when they're administrative, they, they basically get decided. Um, and if it went to a hearing examiner, there'd be at least an opportunity for the public to comment on it before a decision was made. Um, that's another choice as well. Could, um, can we have, I mean, it, does it have to be passed now? I mean, do we have somebody dying to put a sign up that the, why this is in front of us or? Well, I hope they're not dying. Well, not dying, but I mean, there's a project going along that this is going to impact. Bill's undertaker is not. Yeah. Uh, is not. No, he's not dying yet. yet. Yeah. He's, he's but. <laughs> but I, I get we have some building going on, and maybe there's been a request, and maybe that's why this is before us now. But if not, can we have some time to think about it, or is this something we have to decide on tonight? Uh, this is not something you need to decide on tonight. So if the committee wants it to come back to uh, another LUTC meeting, that would be fine. Uh, I, th I just think that staff would probably need a little bit of direction on what you would like for us to do. Well, uh, as homework, I'm not sure there's any from my standpoint, I'm not sure there's any more staff work to do. It's this is I don't know. Maybe it's just being from 20 years ago or back when I was a young council member going through this is why I not so like, hey, I want to sign on to this today. If the council does want to put their fingerprints on it more of course there's the option to vote in amendments at first reading you know to pass it through for for discussion with the entire council and then to modify or change it at that point that's an option yeah. what's that or not pass it, or not pass it. yeah, yeah. I, one one comment that i have and this just muddies the water all the more it doesn't clarify anything it just you know back when you know i mean some of those signs that that you showed uh you know, Pike Place Market and and uh, uh, Starbucks and everything, they weren't iconic when they were first built, you know. And, uh, you know, they, they've become iconic over the years. Uh, you know, who's to say that there isn't the possibility of some, you know, of the next Starbucks or whatever, of, of whatever sort it is, that's founded in federal way that could eventually be a iconic worldwide that everybody recognizes and yet uh, uh, because Federal Way said that it had to be 20 years old we never let it be created here like I say that that's only muddying the water more that is not resolving anything but uh, um, but it presents an interesting question as I see it um, thank you chair yep. if we do not pass this will dicks be allowed to put up their sign so the signs um so um again this code amendment's not for dicks um, no, I, I put that on the record uh the what dicks would like to do is um basically a freestanding sign at the driveway on pack highway mm -hmm. um that sign uh what they typically would like to do there is not allowed it's considered a pull sign. And then the sign that's on the building, um, you know, they have the, the canopy comes out and they like their dick sign above the canopy. That's not allowed under the current sign code because signs above the roof line is not allowed. So can we take these on a case by case basis? Because a dick's is, I mean, you can't. Uh, so I'll let the city attorney weigh in on that. So I, I think that's exactly what this code is trying to accomplish is to allow us to take quote unquote iconic signs on a case by case basis. Currently, we don't have the flexibility yeah. to do that in our code. In other words, th there is a there is a variance process in the sign code currently, but I, I don't think that it would suffice to permit specifically what what um, this this Dick's proposal is so in other words we don't currently have the ability to take something like that on a case-by-case -case basis this would allow us to so I have a comp you bring up an interesting point uh, 
Linda. So somebody coming in new could put up one of these iconic signs if it's to figure to be iconic. But somebody who's been here for a while that has a sign, could they come back in and say, I want to put up, I've been here 20 years, I started in the Northwest, I want to have an iconic sign? Absolutely. I mean, is it Applebee's considered iconic sign if they decided, I want something like the new guy who put it in on the roof? Uh, they've been around 20 years. I don't know. They probably didn't come from the Northwest. Yeah, I but Northwest. I mean, <laughs> I, I, we, we tried to create a box with yeah. clear edges um, so that we wouldn't be facing like all of that, bless you. Um, so, so I think, I mean, if there was, a, say, a business in Federal Way that either started in Federal Way or started somewhere in the in you know Metro Seattle, uh, that's 20 years old, and they want to come, and they're located in the city center, and they wanted now to do an iconic sign, and you know, that is what this is trying to do. That'd be great. I think if they got rid of their bland sign that was allowed under our super strict sign code. <laughs> and could do something a little bit more creative and artistic. Um, I think that is what we're trying to do. And I know it sounds scary. Oh, it's not. <laughs> well, for signs, it is. So, Chair, um, if I may. Yes, go right ahead. <clears throat> I, I don't think um, by passing this ordinance is going to harm us in any way. And thank you for that explanation. I mean, it gives us more flexibility to consider case by case basis. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have any problem of approving this or moving this forward. Thank you. Would you like to make a motion? I would. Mr. Chair, I move to forward the proposed ordinance to the first reading on January 3rd, 2023. I second the motion. Okay, it's been moved and seconded, and it's going to go, what, to? Uh, first reading. First reading. So we might want some more questions when we go to first yeah. reading. But all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> okay. Sound transit updates. <laughs> Good evening again. So again, I'm Kent Smith with the City of Federal Public Works Department. <laughs> no problem. And I am here for the sound transit updates for December. All right. So for north of 317th Street for the Federal Way Link Extension, uh, they're continuing to do landscape work, noise wall construction, uh, working on the systems duct bank, and then MSC wall along the whole corridor. They have chosen a design for the slope stability issues they encountered, and it looks like Sound Transit is reviewing the 60% at this point. And they continue to do a uh, little bit of deck work along um, South 288th Street, well, at South 288th Street, Military Road, at Star Lake, Military Road at 304th. For the city center, um, the work within the right-of-way in the city core is on hold um, due to the moratorium. So, however, city staff is working with Sound Transit and QIT, the, the contractor, um, on the next stages, essentially, to ensure that their phasing of, of how that construction will work will be a little smoother, so we're, we're looking at and specifically the, the portion where the new roundabout will be located at 23rd and South 317th. They're continuing work on the station, which includes CMU walls and some concrete work for the stairs at the south and north. Um, and they're continuing working on the garage, um, pouring um, some of the elements with that, also concrete work. And then utility crossings. Uh, for 23rd and 317th are expected to begin at the beginning of January, so of 2023, and the construction of the end-of-line facility is also ongoing. For the operations and maintenance facility south, uh, the FEIS is now expected in May of 2023 with an action to build in June. 
uh, and but they do expect project completion uh, in 2029. For the Tacoma Dome Link extension, I don't have any updates since the last meeting. Essentially, we're still working through some of the potential environmental constraints, and I won't answer any questions. Yeah, where you had uh, moratorium on that second slide. Yes. Is that is that a moratorium due to the slide or the unstable ground or what is what is what's a mor what's the moratorium on? So within the the um, development standards, there's a there's a set period of time when work in the right of way is not allowed in the city core, and they're just basically complying with that. That in order to keep traffic flowing smoothly as possible, there's no road closures. So that's a city core moratorium. That's something we impose, not yes. And that we do, and that's something that's been there forever. Everybody knew about it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Could, could you explain that just a little bit more? I mean, just for our edification, what meant by the moratorium and what it accomplishes? Uh, sure. Essentially, um, it's not allowing lanes to be closed or right of way work in that specific city core area so that traffic still continues to flow. We essentially have them got, get all of their traffic control out of the right-of-way um, and then restore things back to either where they were or complying with, with standards so that pedestrians can walk through, cars can move through freely. Essentially from, um, it says the Friday uh, of Thanksgiving week, but because of the holidays it also, it comes back to like the Wednesday before. Uh, at noon until um, after the new year. So okay. I think it so is. I, I like so it's a moratorium during the? During, during the, the holiday season. Okay. All right. Gotcha. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So from, like Kent said, from noon before Thanksgiving through January 2nd, we do not allow lane obstructions anywhere in the city core. Yeah. That's in city code. It's been there for many years. No, that, that, that makes perfect we, sense. It just we want, all the, we want all the shoppers to get to the mall on time. Absolutely, yeah, so, absolutely. Don't want to slow down Santa. The Commons Mall is the one that lobbied for this many, many years ago, and, and the city adopted it, and it's been in place ever since. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Honda. Thank you. Um, so I'll ask my two normal questions on the public artwork and the proposed meeting that Sound Transit was going to have with the public? Yes, so f in regard to the artwork, um, Sound Transit, some Sound Transit staff is going to present at the Arts Commission in January. Um, this was at the request of the Arts Commission, so essentially that they're not quite sure what, if, what they will have to present um, about new art. It's, it's probably going to come back to being existing stuff unless they get receive something from the artist for the well who was who was doing the elephant that no longer exists essentially um, the elephant exists just not here <laughs> not not here uh, in regards to the other public meeting that they're hoping to have um, they're st still waiting to hear back from the tribes and at this point uh, they haven't heard anything last I've spoken to them about it so until they have that direction, uh, they won't have that because that essentially they need they need their input to have the to have the public meeting correct correctly. So then the route from Federal Way to Fife is still not decided. Essentially, yes. Okay. And, um, hmm. All right. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Keith, it's your turn. Anything that has to do with planning and housing has got to be fun, <laughs> especially at the end of the meeting. <laughs> and it's no action, so it's even better. <laughs> uh, given the receptivity I got to what I thought were the easy ones, this one's going to be uh, this one's going to be a gem. All right. <laughs> um, hey, hey, no. <laughs> okay, um, I am, uh,
I'm going to pull on a memory thread since some of you weren't on council when we did our code amendments uh, in 2021. Uh, some of you were following my antics at planning commission and at council, but we're not yet up on the dais. Uh, so if you remember when we uh, processed some code amendments in 2021 to be responsive to House Bill 1220, um, we were basing our expected need on the overnight count, on kind of some math that we kind of put together. And we all kind of recognized, I think, that this was kind of maybe a stopgap. And at some point, we were going to get our numbers um, rolled down uh, from the state and to from the county. Um, so that's getting close now. And that's really what I'm here to kind of walk you through. So a lot of numbers. And for the last agenda item, I apologize. It's going to be a little heady, but I'll try and uh, make this make as much sense as possible. So this is an informational uh, only agenda item. Uh, following the presentation, the options for consideration include either no further action or request follow-up action from staff. And we can do additional analysis if you would like. So um, in gross, second, substitute House Bill 1220, change GMA, Growth Management Act housing. Uh, it used to say encourage the availability of affordable uh, housing, and now it says plan for and accommodate a house, housing affordable to all economic segments of the population of the state, promote a variety of residential densities and housing types, and encourage preservation of existing housing stock. Um, so in response, as I mentioned earlier, to this legislative requirement, the city amended its zoning code in 2021 to allow for the provision of emergency housing and shelters and permanent supportive housing. And what these little word changes mean in the RCW basically is we are going to get housing numbers at all income bands from uh, permanent supportive housing to zero to 30 to 30 to 50 to and so on and so forth. And we're going to have to show that we can accommodate all of that within our city as part of our comprehensive plan periodic update that's going through right now. So all of this is kind of kind of weaving together. So these are the draft numbers that came and I apologize. Hopefully you can kind of see this. Um, otherwise, I can take, uh, take a trick and try and increase the size of this. Uh, these are the numbers that the state um, allocated to King County. Um, so what that says is uh, 80,813 uh, 0 to 30% non-permanent supportive housing units, uh, 48,728 permanent supportive housing units, 48,000 and change, 31 to 50, 21,000 and change, 51 to 80, uh, 14,000 change, 81 to 100, 16,000 change, uh, 100 to 120, um, and 78,120 plus, and then 57,000 emergency uh, housing and shelter units. That means overnight it's, shelter. So the difference between that and the zero 30 to 30 percent AMI is the emergency housing is is intended to be temporary, whereas you could be making zero percent AMI and be in the zero to 30 permanent supportive housing. Um, that is possible. So emergency is is temporary. And, and this is all for King County, not this is all. So yeah, so no. this is what I'm going to talk to you tonight is about King County. Okay. Um, Pierce County, Snohomish County, Kitsap County, they're doing a they're doing whatever they're doing. This is the King County scenario that I'm sharing with you this evening. So the countywide housing need is a number of new units needed in King County for the period of 2020 to 2044. That number came from the Washington Department of Commerce. All right. So then what King County did was then they created the allocation methodology. And that is the process to take that aggregate number that we looked at on that last slide and dole it out to all the cities in King County and the unincorporated areas. And then our job is this last kind of uh, icon here, which is to basically make sure that we can accommodate those numbers that they give us. All right. Now, 
what we're going to talk about a little bit is this allocation methodology because you can say, okay, well, how do you take one big number and divide it into a bunch of littler numbers? Well, they chose, and again, I apologize for the size of this. What I want you to do is, is focus on that there are three columns here. There's what's called option one, there's option two, and then there's option three. And, it, and what you can notice here before we dive into the three options is that the emergency housing for federal way does not change under any of the options, okay? So that's a constant. So what's that number? You got zero to 5,000, is that like 2,500? based on your graph on the far, I mean, you've got these bar graphs, but you don't have numbers associated with how many of those are. Yeah, that's not the point yet. Okay, we're gonna, so, see, we're gonna so, see that though, So right? you're gonna get, we're gonna get there in a second. What I, what, I, what, I wanted, what I want you to focus on here is the three options and the, the emergency, the permanent supportive housing and the zero to 30% housing are, is this stacked bar over here on the left of each of these. Um, the, uh, you know, and then it gets to the lower bars are, this is for the 121 plus percent, right? So it, it increases in uh, affordability as you move to the right of each of these options. So when you look at these three options, um, this option three, which right now is the county's preferred option, that has us getting the smallest number of zero to 30 percent permanent supportive housing and zero to 30 percent non-permanent supportive housing. So I just want you to put that in the back of your mind for a moment as I switch to our numbers. All right. So here's our numbers. Um, under option three that's currently being reviewed by King County, these are our numbers for uh, the different income bands. Uh, and I'm going to stop talking for a second. Um, I'll let you, I'll come back to any of these when you guys have questions, all right? And I can give you this presentation more than happy to do so. Sorry if some of these weren't in your packet. Um, so this is just a lot of numbers, all right? This is us and the other cities uh, that I thought were relevant. Um, if you look at, you can basically compare the total number of units by band within each city. You know, I'd love to say that there was a clear um, uh, output for this that I could speak to, but frankly, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and so I, I think all, all it tells me is you know, there's a lot of emergency housing when you look at that first column in all the cities. I mean, you know, even, you know, Bothell, which is the smallest at a thousand, a thousand's a lot of emergency housing units. Um, so there, we can go back and spend some time on this. This is what I kind of wanted to get down to. So these are allocation. Can I, can I ask you a question on that, to the numbers you just had? Absolutely. Have? So it, it's like somebody just had a dartboard <laughs> I mean, what's the rhyme or reason why Kent, which is bigger than we are, has less? And I mean, is it is there any scientific method to these numbers, or is it just somebody said, "Here's what we are hoping you'll accept"? Um, so I can I can give you my understanding of this, yeah. and if Sarah wants to add, um, I will call on a friend. Yeah. Um, so basically. It's, they, they, they started with kind of your percentage of your total housing growth and allocated it out by band, but then they adjusted e the bands based on kind of either what your kind of income is um, and what you have already. Um, so in some ways, like having, um, you know, the extended stay, I think is one of the reasons why our permanent support of housing is less than it otherwise would be if we had none, um, and why fusion helps. So, mm -hmm. if do you, did you want to? So that's why Bellevue's got 6,500 because they don't have any hotels yet. <laughs> you need to come. I mean, I, I, I'm just. Yeah. No. I mean. And and I don't even think the extended stay is counted. Because um, it isn't open yet. Think, yeah, they don't have occupancy, so that wouldn't be reflected in in mm -hmm. these needs. But it is adjusting for existing housing stock, income, employment opportunities, 
Um, so, so it's trying to equalize some of that across the county. So if we have more, like we do in the 50 to 80 percent range, then our numbers are going to be a little bit lower because we do have more housing stock at that lower income band. Does that help? Yeah. Uh, and then, and then I'll say emergency housing is separate, and I don't fully understand the methodology aside from how they got to that larger target at the state level. But Can you define emergency housing? Per our code or per the state? Well, uh, it for whatever this is being used for. I'm, I'm looking at the definition, Sarah, if you'd like me to. Yeah, I'll let you read it. To do that. Um, so emergency housing and emergency shelter are two different things. Um, emergency housing means temporary indoor accommodations for individuals or families who are homeless or at an imminent risk of becoming homeless that is intended to address basic health, food, clothing, personal hygiene needs that may or may not require occupants to enter into a lease or occupancy. That's emergency housing. Shelter is, and I'm not going to read every word in this one, but facility that provides temporary shelter for individuals or families who are currently homeless. Um, includes day and warming centers that do not provide overnight accommodations. So like fusion would be considered uh, emergency housing then. And what is temporary? Well, well, well okay, they, they, now you had two different things. You had, Kent, you said that the, the first thing that you read was what? Emergency housing. housing. Emergency housing. The second thing you read was? Emergency shelter. Emergency shelter. So like fusion would be emergency housing. For the Pete Anderson Fusion Family Center, that is correct. They also have their transitional housing, which would be in that permanent supportive housing group. Yeah, and just okay. just to further on from that, there's two more categories that I haven't read here that are relevant, which is transitional housing and permanent permanent supportive housing. So there's four of those categories that are new that are um, we're required to plan for that are specifically relevant to the questions you're asking. Just, just so you know. So, so where, which, where would transitional housing fall in this? Permanent, permanent supportive housing. Okay. All right. So, so is, is temporary considered 90 days or less? I think it's six months, isn't it? More like six months, I think. Okay. Okay, let me get to, I think I have one slide. Um, so, so this one, and we can go back. Uh, we can go back and forth any, as, as much as you want. The map on the right, sorry, small maps. Uh, this is our emergency housing and shelter um, map uh, that GIS put together for us. And so what this shows is the thousand linear foot separation that's required in between these facilities. And what the blue represents is public schools. So those facilities need to be at least 1,000 feet away from each other and from public schools. So what, what I can tell you about this map is that we can meet that number that they said we need to meet. I think we're solid on the um, emergency housing and shelter. On the left is our permanent supportive housing. And if you remember this conversation, it started with a horizontal separation of 3 quarters of a mile. It then went through the planning commission and went up to a mile, um, and then it ended up at a mile and a half. So right now, those those circles that you see um, represent a mile and a half diameter circle. And so when you, if you start to, based on the zoning, uh, put the maximum number of units within each of those that are multifamily or commercially zoned, and then the single families cap out at six units each, if you do that math, we can't get to what we need to for our need. So we're going to have to, at some point, this is my message to you guys, we're going to have to go back and either change the horizontal separation or we limited it to 50 units um, per project. And we can either change horizontal separation and or cap size or both to get to the number we need to get to. So that'll be something, and, and my suggestion to you all is we don't do that until that number gets solid because I don't wanna do this again and again and again. So, so that is kind of my takeaway for tonight. Um, so, and, and now we can do questions. So we get to do a lot of fun map things, but what, what's the penalty if we don't do anything? We say, 
no, we're not going to comply with this. Uh, they don't certify our comp plan. Okay, so then what happens? Uh, we don't get a lot of money that we otherwise get from the state and I the SRC. Okay. And is, do you know if any of these numbers are based on land mass, geography? I mean, some of those cities square mile wise are much smaller than Federal Way and they have more people. I mean, it's just. It's based, it, the starting point is um, the housing targets. And all of us have agreed to uh, housing targets for the next 20 years. And so what they did then is they sliced and diced the housing targets to get to the bans. And who, you know, when you have this many emergency facilities, again, I'm not saying that's bad. Who's going to pay for it? Yeah. I mean, and not just as, I mean, and are, are we're going to go to all our citizens and say, hey, we decided we're going to tax you all another $500 a month to pay for this? Or? Well, and as Sarah and I talked, it's not just the building of them, which is tens of millions of dollars Who's gonna uh, manage it? per project. It's the operation. Yeah. Well, uh, one thing I think interesting here is that the uh, what it shows that we need the most of is the 120 plus. <laughs> you know, I mean, well, I mean but we, we, we've got to start building some more luxury houses. Uh, expensive housing. We've got to find some more, that's, more that's, waterfront. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I, I just kind of get the feeling that the county isn't going to uh, be as concerned if we don't make those goals as what it is on the, the other end. Oh, we can, but, uh, so, that, but, but, but it sounds to me that that's, hey, that's where our emphasis needs to be. That's where the biggest number is. Yeah, what park do we have that can hold 2,091 people? <laughs> I mean, build a building on some steel lake or something? Yeah, I just, I think Keith already said this, but it, it bears mentioning again, which is that this is our requirement to plan to allow for this growth. It's not a requirement that in a certain year we have exactly this number that's not what's getting tracked. It's our, it's, it's our requirement to plan to allow that number. Yeah. So there will be reporting every five years on this data. Okay. That so, is another unfunded mandate from the state. Yeah. So what happens if we don't get to the magic number that they want us to get to by a certain time? Or is it possible <clears throat> that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the state legislature in the coming years will change this and reduce these numbers because some of them just don't simply don't make sense well um, my crystal ball is probably no better than yours my guess is um, you know one of the things that uh, King County talked about with us before we got our new new targets mm -hmm. was if we are not making progress on a, attaining our targets they could ask for us to take what they call corrective measures. Now, what does that mean? That's super vague, it's super scary. Um, what I would tell you is back to Council Member Walsh's uh, comment, you know, if we don't get any of those 5,300, 120 plus, you know, nice houses in the next 20 years, um, my guess is nobody's gonna come after us with a stick and say you need to provide incentives for rich people to come here. Uh, but if we're, on the other hand, not attaining our uh, permanent supportive or zero to 30 or 30 to 50 units. Um, they may ask for the city to, would the city, you know, entertain any incentives to get those bans to happen. So that's, you know, this is uncharted. We're in a new, this is a new world order as far as uh, state granularity of city planning activities. And so I think, you know, we're gonna have to kind of see how this works, but I think to, to Kent's comment earlier, we need to show that we can accommodate it. And if it doesn't happen, then we can have a conversation, but at least the starting point is, can it, can it get here um, based on our existing code? And right now, we only have a problem with the permanent supportive housing. Uh, we can't get to the 1,073 number with our current separation and caps. But we can get to the emergency? Yep. Hmm. An emergency, so. excuse me, emergency, nobody pays for it. I mean, that's an emergency. Nobody's paying a mortgage. Nobody's paying rent. It's just here's a place to live tonight. But permanent supported housing, who's paying for that? Do the people contribute to where they live? 
So typically they pay a portion of their income. If, so they have to be, first off, they have to be making uh, 30% of the area median income or less. Yes. And then they typically pay 30% of their income, whatever that happens to be, right. or their housing. So, so it's, it's kind of a variable rate scenario based on what they're making. Right, but then who makes up the difference, the other 70%? Is that some charity organization, or is that the state, or is that the county, or is that the city of Federal Way, or does anybody said anything like that yet? It's going to depend on who the operator is and how they're funded, whether, where they get their money from, whether it's from the feds, the state, the city, the county. Okay. It will be publicly subsidized, most likely. Yeah, so if somebody builds a house and has 20 rooms in it and they rent 20 of the rooms, we that counts towards 20 of the 1,073? Uh, it Potentially. could. Potentially. If they have an operating plan and a license and yeah. all the other things that right. they require. I mean, yeah, okay, so we have a bunch of tenements being built. Not, okay, sorry. Yes, President. Uh, so I'll make a statement and then I'll ask a question. So um, 20 years ago, with the Growth Management Act and um, talking about housing in this city, we did the comprehensive plan with putting density in the air in the downtown, thinking that nobody would want to build an apartment building in our downtown. Well, fast forward. That's changed now. Um, but that uh, allowed for the um, ability for us to receive our transportation funds and whatnot from the county and the state and the federal. So um, with the density in the neighborhoods, as you're talking about, um, Chair Dobie, that's where we were discussing previously where um, you could have those residential, um, you could have art uh, real estate investors who would come in and buy an eighth of a house and buy, you know, and then uh, have the, um, it would be a halfway house or a, a residential living for um, people who are, or having addictions, whatever, in the, in the residential neighborhoods. And so I think that that's what, why we had that mile and a half. Uh, so I don't think we have a problem as long as we've allowed for it. I don't know how they're going to come after us. I mean, if it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, we might have to look at different zones we have and do some rezoning to get more density in places that we haven't looked at before. So now that we know what our number is, I think part of the strategy will be to figure out how to maybe uh, make it a little bit more detailed. Because right now we just said mile and a half, either 50 or six. The, the cap in the single family was six. Um, and we could go to, we could keep the cap at six in single family and keep it mile and a half. But then when we get to our uh, multifamily and commercial zones, we could dial it down to three quarters of an acre, for example, or three quarters of a mile instead of a mile and a half. So we can look at, we'll, we'll look at those toggles and see what some of that looks like. And we'll bring that back to council for conversation. I have a Everybody question. Mayor, Honda. Um, where does senior housing fall into this? Because we have quite a bit of senior housing that has been built in the last 10, 15 years. Where does that fall into this? Um, so senior housing is falls into a subset of each of these, right? Because you could have senior at 120% of AMI. You could have senior at 30% of AMI. So, so the, age, the age component is kind of another layer to these bands, but it's a subset. So, so you could have uh, general populace at 50% AMI and then senior at 50% AMI. And together, those would be part of our 840. Did that answer your question? No, not really. So <laughs> if, um, so the Mirror Lake senior housing that just came online last year or the year before, when, if someone were to rent uh, a room there <clears throat> or a, an apartment there, their income then is, I'm is um, documented so that it would fit a target? 
So the answer to shag is yes. I don't know about Mirror Lake. They have, to have, like they have covenants. So yes, they're, they're income restricted at Mirror Lake, I'm told. OK. Oh, LITAC, yeah. So that would be, I think, 50% AMI. So are all of the senior housing, like Village Green, um, are they all income at some level, income restricted? Um, the, the, all I can speak to is I know SHAG, uh, which is Celebration, and um, there's another one. Right. Uh, they are. Um, but like, I don't know if like the, the one that's next to the um, Sound Transit Garage on the east end, the Korean one, I don't know if it is income restricted. It is. Mm -hmm. So it, it could be that all of the newer senior housing that have been built in the city is all income restricted. And, and just to answer that from a little bit of a legal perspective, um, it may be as a practical matter that all the recent, just like Keith just said, all the recent senior citizen housing is income restricted. But senior citizen housing, as that term is defined in our code, there, it's not linked to income. So you could have senior citizen housing under our code that is not income limited. There's nothing preventing that from happening from a legal perspective. There might be market reasons for that not happening. So, oh, okay. So follow up on the Deputy Mayor's comment. If we were became the shag housing center place that people wanted to come because our zoning was right for that, then we would meet these, if they were income restricted, we would meet these criteria. Because I'm assuming a shag is, you know, 0 to 30, 31 to 50, could be even good with the PHS. But if we had the shag center of King County, would that help us meet our goals? Um, I would say no for a lot of different reasons. Oh. Um, I mean, I think, I think what we're trying to do, you know, I don't think we want – you know, our, our housing target for the next 20 years is 14,000. I think I've kind of drilled that number into your head. Um, I think if all of them end up being senior housing. Uh, not not senior housing, because he said we couldn't do that. I'm saying SHAG, which is discounted housing. Well, SHAG stands for senior housing. Yeah, 55 um, and above. Um, uh, income restricted. In income, income restricted. Yeah. I mean, so if. So if the city wanted to um, target income restricted housing, um, I, my, my personal belief that even if we wanted all of our housing growth to be income restricted, we probably couldn't do that because every income restricted, we couldn't get there because almost every income restricted project needs public subsidies to make the economics work, whether it's tax abatements or uh, public investment from like an Amazon or a Microsoft or something from the city. And so at some point, there's not enough money. So, so we could get a bigger share than we might otherwise get if we were going to try and actively, aggressively try to get that type of housing. But it doesn't happen very easily. Qu question. Uh, here in Federal Way, we have a huge number of adult family homes. But where does that play into the whole equation? So those are technically another type of housing. Those are more like a like an assisted living or, or almost and sometimes even like a nursing facility. And so those are those are a whole other those are like a business They're expensive um, too. more than like a individual residences. Does that make sense? OK, so they wouldn't fall into these numbers anywhere then. No. OK. All right. And then the other question is, is that these numbers are supposed to be what we need to increase to, correct? These numbers are what we need to make sure our zoning would allow for. Okay, so, okay, so our zoning needs to, okay, let, let, let's go to that, that top one, that 120. Uh, okay. Okay, our zoning needs to allow for 5,300 of those. Uh, right now, there's probably 5,300 households like that already. So are, are we talking that needs to allow overall, or do we need to allow an increase? Increase. These are, these are additive okay. numbers. All right. Okay. And so if it's an increase, where is day zero or year zero? I mean, or is it an ongoing? I mean, because we were saying that, that, hey, last year, you know, they were saying we need to have an increase. Is this 
an increase from 2020, an increase from 2022, an increase from when? Yeah, these are these are from 2019 to 2044. So, so from 2019 this, is is point zero. Yeah. On it then. Okay. And and the hard thing about it, and so this to take take your example. So you know, 120 percent AMI housing. Let's uh, let's call that a seven hundred thousand dollar something. That could either be a single family detached unit, and you guys got a presentation on how many single family lots we have left, which I think that's 1,800, so that's not that. And so it could be some of that, and it could be some, there's gotta be some condos built at some point that falls in that bandwidth, but our zoning allows for it. It doesn't mean that the market will provide it. It means it could be built in our city if somebody wanted to. We're not precluding it. And I think that's the, that's the bar that's being set for us, is you've got to allow for this. You don't have to do it. You don't have to make sure that it happens, but you have to allow for it. Um, and as long as our zoning allows for it, I think we should be fine. But again, we're in new territory. So, so with that, as, as time goes on, there will be increase of housing in some type of unit or another. And right. so at some point, that increase will probably make it so that even if the zoning would allow it, there won't be room for another area. So it could, you're right. So it could be that, so we're gonna to have to report out every five years. That's the obligation that the city has. So let's assume five years from now, we report out our housing growth. And let's say that we got all of our 840 at 31 to 50% AMI. Um, and let's say we got a thousand. So now, you know, we've got more than what we needed to. Um, but let's say that we haven't gotten any at the at the 120 percent, you know, so we'll know. So at least, you know, we will know kind of as we're trying to meet these targets, how we're doing along the way. And it could very well be that we see that some of these categories, we may not add any housing in the next five years. Um, and that's part of our monitoring and reporting out along the way. So, so could it get to the point where we could say, hey, somebody wants to do something that would be the 51, 51 to 80 AMI, and we, would we have to say, hey, sorry, you can't do it. Well, we're, if you do it, we're not gonna have room for something else. No, these aren't ceilings, they're just targets. So, so again, this is, this is, we need to plan for these numbers but there's no, there's no cap. There's no like glass ceiling where we can't get past. Um, you know, if, if, if it so happens that we build um, twice as many units at 100 to 120% AMI over the next 20 years, good for us. Um, that, might, that might tell us some other things that are going on, like maybe our local wage income is going up for people to actually afford those units. And so there's going to be, I mean, this will be, again, just a data point for us to track um, and, and see kind of how it goes. But we need to make sure our zoning can accommodate. So I'm going to make one more comment. And then it would seem to me if, we're, if we meet all our numbers, like a 51 to 80 up, nobody's going to have a problem. But if we don't make our numbers from 50 down to emergency, somebody's going to be knocking on our door. Is that pretty much how you take it? If I was a gambling person, um, I would probably say that's a good bet. Okay. I, I would I'll, I'll just to just to play, say that a little bit differently as well. Okay. Cities, You're more diplomatic. Yeah. Cities You're usually. Attorney. Do you want to come up? Cities aren't usually incentivized to restrict the amount of 120 percent plus that they have in their city. However, it's much more likely that a city might not necessarily be thrilled with additional emergency or PSH housing. I have a quick question. Yeah, I just want to, um, quick question, I forgot. Do we have an ordinance that uh, regulates how many uh, um, non-related individuals can live in a single family household? We we do not um so we are not allowed by state law to regulate the number of unrelated people that live together in a single household however um we have passed the family okay um however council passed an amendment to our family definition which 
regulates the manner in which a group of people can live together and still constitute a single family. So we're not directly regulating the number of people that can live together because that wouldn't be allowed under state law. But for instance, our family definition would not allow a 20 bedroom single family home where each room is rented to a person who rents it for a month and then a new person comes in. That would not be allowed in a single family zone under our code due to our family definition. So I've had a complaint from someone who said that there was a house that was being uh, a number of different uh, vehicles coming and going and that, that I mean that live there um, and would change over time. So we don't have any regulation that says how many, because obviously they're renting, but we don't have any regulation that stipulates, you know, how many people, how many people you can rent to or unrelated or anything of that nature. No, that, that's exactly what state law explicitly prohibits us from doing. So we've tried to be creative to address exactly that problem of, you know, where there's a million cars at a single family home specifically because there are a ton of rooms that are rented out to people that don't know each other and don't live together. That's what we, we've, uh, we've attempted to regulate it the best way we legally can without using a specific number, in other words. Yes, Mr. Walsh. One more question, uh, and Sarah. Don't don't go anywhere, because <laughs> this is really for Sarah. But it's uh, uh, <laughs> but earlier, uh, Keith, you you mentioned the the one night count. Sarah, do, do you know if normally it's in January? This last year it didn't happen. Uh, do you know if it, there's going to be a one night count this year, this it next is. year? It is my understanding that there will be, and the King County Regional Homelessness Authority will be doing that. I've not heard any updates in terms of when that I will follow up and let you know. Well, we know when. Uh, any of the details or if there's a waiver process again that somebody might look to, but I'll provide an update to council. Okay, all right. I mean, I've for quite a few years I've participated in the one night count, so just that's just for my own curiosity, and I imagine a lot of other people in the community would like to know that too. Thank you. Okay, I see no more blue mics, and it's 7 whatever it is, 35 or something, 7.33. So we'll uh, adjourn our meeting unless you have any other great news, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to stop okay. while I'm perceived to be ahead. <laughs> hey, you just think of it. We get to be geography majors. It'll be fun. Indeed. Good night, everyone. Thank you.